So we kind of met here. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, no, I remember you um, came up to me after a talk I gave and um, said some, I thought, some wise and interesting things. So it caught my attention. I, I remember that you'd said at the end of the talk, if you've got any ideas, yeah. come and chat. Yeah. And so I did, and then it very quickly turned into actually I get way too many emails. <laughs> so <laughs> yeah. Um, when I said when I said come up and talk to me, what I meant yeah, was don't. <laughs> so that was that was a long time ago. It must be six or seven <laughs> years. But, um, um, yeah. But yeah, I guess just to whip through it, like I worked I worked on out of the wreckage. We started work together on Regenesis, and then that got truncated by your accident. Yeah, oh yeah, nice little <laughs> euphemistic <laughs> yeah. like that. Um, after the first book, I then got very, very depressed, mm. um, and and the accident that you're referring to is yeah, jumping, jumping off a six-story building. But in a sort of unconscious state. I well, mean, I don't remember it. Yeah, no. yeah. Um, I know, I know vaguely what happened, pieced together by various people who were there. Um, I mean, the way I see it, it's like something that happened to you, you know, it was like... Yeah, or at me, yeah. Yes, yeah, so or at you, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It was from my then therapist's window. I landed and I was bleeding out and somebody found me and they thought I was robbing the place. Um, <laughs> and I propped myself up on a planter and was talking to them and somebody just upstairs realized what was going on and called an ambulance. Mm. Since then I've been massively dissociated so I mm. feel like there's this dislocation from the consensus reel. Dissociated I, from everything? Yeah, yeah. I've got this really strong depersonalization, derealization going on mm. where I've just had to, at first it was really terrifying but I have to kind of surf it. C can you explain it a bit more? Sure. Um, it's a bit like I'm reading lines that somebody else has written for me that or I've written for me but a version of me from somewhere else that I'm having to just perform in a way mm. and there's a there's a there's a level of insulation between me and material physical reality when I jumped and when I was in the ambulance I was apparently ranting at them about climate change <laughs> 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 But I've been a like, climate activist of sorts since I was 12, 13. It's been a huge driver of the intensity and the focus of my various madnesses. I've been diagnosed with bipolar and a host of other things too. And it wasn't until I found other modalities and ways of understanding mental health as much more social, psychological and ecological that I could let myself believe and feel that the dissociation is a survival mechanism. Right. After my accident, I, I was really keen to rush back into my work and mm. activism and research and new economic stuff. Mm. And a really good friend, and this is while I, my leg was in the cage, and I'd lost one leg at that point, and mm. the other one was trying to get fixed. He just said, if you want a project just dig into why this happened. And it was around the time that eco-anxiety was coming up as a topic. There's a masking that happens when we use that term, and there's an obfuscation. The way that climate change affects our minds is so much more diverse and so much more heterogeneous and comes through so many different causal pathways that just calling it eco-anxiety can be quite constraining and something that people don't mm. relate to. What happens to people who are being hit by climate shocks, um, you know, depression rates soar and suicide soars and psychotic visions. Western doctors often characterize them as non-specific psychological distress because mm. they don't have a framework for a different cultural understanding of the mind. Yes, it's an interesting thing, isn't it? That you know, we, we, we're never in any doubt about how other kinds of disasters affect people's mental health. Mm. There's no doubt about how war affects mental health. Similarly, um, you know, earthquakes or any other natural disaster. But 
It's taken us so long to get to grips with the impact of the biggest disaster of all, which is the gathering collapse of Earth systems. Mm. And I think the same blockage is there that um, has prevented us from getting to grips politically with it, getting to grips economically with it, mm. getting to grips socially with it. We're not getting to grips psychologically with it. Yeah. And, and the idea that sort of somehow this one will pass us by. It won't have a massive impact on our state of mind. Is is? I mean, it justifies everything we know about every other aspect of human psychology. Mm, mm. Which also like proves quite empirically as well as experientially that environment has a material impact on the mind, of course, and on communities mm. and on the way that we look after one another and cope mm. and what was really strange and difficult when I was trying to get the book published was that so many people that I spoke to framed psychological distress as a result of climate impacts in the global south mm. as natural suffering. Natural suffering? Yeah, because of course people are going to be, right. you know, they're just yeah. having a hard time, they've been hit, like, yeah. sure. And there was a circular log logic that happened yeah. where, as a result of it being natural, it would kind of just play out and like you yeah. need to use Maslow's hierarchy of needs mm. and deal with the material aid and then you know self-actualization mm. comes mm. at the top and Maslow Maslow was the man who said that he wouldn't study disabled people because it would lead to a crippled psychology and a crippled <laughs> philosophy <laughs> it's like we're all yeah. we're all we're all messed up yeah and yeah. and it's also just if the mind comes last mm. then it's it's an effacement, it's an objectification. You know, this word natural, uh, Raymond Williams said that nature is the most complex word in the English language. And it's because you load onto it whatever you want to load mm. onto it. Right? Mm. And, you know, if something's good, it's natural. If something's bad, it's unnatural. This idea that, you know, natural suffering amongst people in the global south, well, they're closer to nature, aren't they? Mm. Mm. You know, because they're mm. further from our civilized mm. uh, picture of ourselves. Exactly. And, yeah. and and it's and and there's something you know really quite disturbing about that concept. I, I mean, I try not to use the word nature or natural at all mm. because I, I find it useless. Mm. It, it's you could just load all sorts of stuff on. Yeah. Same way as you know, I I don't understand the concept of authenticity except when it's applied to arts or antiques. You know. <laughs> That's kind of what I mean about when we pull at these threads, right? Mm, mm. Because we've got Western, mostly biomedical mm. approach to how we treat problems in the mind. Mm. Only 10% of countries in the world have a climate mental health plan. Mm. And the, all of them, pretty much, are to do with more psychiatrists, mm. more medication, and, yeah. and no communal levels of coping no. and support. I think it speaks to this tremendously simplistic model of what help means mm. you know help very often being something which is handed down from above and often completely shorn of context mm. and completely failing to get to grips with the structural causes of people's distress <laughs> some of the most effective pragmatic joyous responses to the intersection of climate change and mental health issues come from community spaces the, and the kind of meso level, the mid level between private and public and, mm. and the commons essentially mm. that mm. are proliferating around the globe yeah. and are the, the happiest, like most wonderful things that I found on this journey. You know, the only s collective survival mechanism we've got is to create neighborhoods and communities where, yeah, people want to be Mm. and where people are going to feel nurtured. Where are we going, by the way? Just down to the river. Oh, right, OK. Don't, don't trip on that. Sorry. We think about evolution in terms of survival of the fittest, and that term wasn't a Darwinian term. What Darwin meant by it when he used it was best fit within an ecosystem. Mm -hmm. And all over the world, whether we're 
dealing with climate change at a distance and it's still really, really messing up our minds, or if it's something that's hitting us materially. Um, with these impacts and the warpings of consensus reality that come from it, as people who do want change, do you have thoughts on how to look after ourselves and each other within that space? I feel increasingly as I get older that it's different for everyone. Mm. You know, I mean, my remedy, which is getting in my sea kayak and going as far from the coast as I can, is probably not going to be the universal remedy, but just any sort of immersion in nature mm. and any encounters with wildlife mm. have a great healing effect on me. But, you know, it's just not going to be the same for everyone. Mm. Um, and, and I think part of the art of living is finding out what it is for you. Mm. What is the special thing that allows you to let go, at least temporarily, of the distress. Mm. You have to get out of yourself. You have to leave all that behind. Like being engaged with a, with a group of people that you trust and mm. can build new worlds with, mm -hmm. however, however those manifest, I feel like that can be deeply curative as well. Yeah. Because I've found nature and being around nature at times incredibly healing and at other times a reminder of how destructive mm. civilization has been and it's painful. You know, without that sense of being held by other people, you, you're hit above all by the extreme loneliness of it. You know, it and can species loneliness. Well, yes. Yeah. It can sometimes seem that, you know, you're amongst very few people who actually give a shit. And that, that can be as devastating as any other aspect of it. The sort of safe place for me is in the scientific literature, is, mm. is in um, rationally documenting it and putting the terror to one side while I do so. Mm. But of course, you know, I, I uh, often feel I'm deceiving myself when I think I'm persuading people what that means. People don't trust empiricism no. anymore. No. And there's the whole anti-elite thing. And that, in a strange way, I feel like that could be quite, quite revolutionary. Mm. If we, no, in a, if, if it went in a certain direction. Yeah. I think it's not at the moment, it's really destructive, but. Well, it's a deliberate misdirection, isn't it? I mean, you know, it's like the revolt against elite power. And what Suella Braverman means when she mm. talks about the elite is anyone with a degree. But also for so long, I mean, just to clarify what I mean, like I have lived proof of the existence of other realities. And I say it with an S because mm. I, I don't deny that there's a material reality, but I believe there are as many realities as there are conscious beings. Science is a choice of what is truth. Mm. There's a hierarchical thing of like thinking is more important than sensation, even though mm. so much of it starts with feeling and sensation mm. and emotion and being stitched into something that we've extricated ourselves from or been pulled out from yeah. by largely colonialism over time. Yeah. And I'm not saying we don't need knowledge, we don't need truth, we don't need science, we do. You know, it's not necessary to subscribe to that substance dualism, you know, the idea that there's a higher sphere in which sure. our minds operate and earthy material realities are totally detached from that. Far from it. You know, we know particularly from the work of Antonio Damasio onwards that mm. you, you cannot separate mind and body. Yeah. You cannot separate mind and society either. You yeah. know, you, you, yeah. You cannot separate well, mind and the natural world. Uh -huh. we, our minds are, are constructed. Porous. And porous, and, yeah. but they are, they, they are the combined effect of, of all these things acting, uh, uh, acting upon them. I've felt so lonely throughout yeah. a lot of my life. Of yeah. Like feeling that mm. I knew that there was this massive thing happening yeah. from almost 20 years ago now. And it's taken me a really long time to, to not rush at this problem myself whenever I felt like normal and not ill, I'd rush it, I'd burn out, I'd get mm. depressed or psychotic. Mm. Or, and I think a lot of movements now have this urgency culture too, they do. Mm. Yeah. But understandably. I've, yeah, understandably. Mm. But I've found a lot of 
a lot of people and organizations around the world and in the UK doing what Adrian Murray Brown calls moving at the pace of trust. Mm. And this actual connection and safety with each other as we try and build new things. And that can yeah. be it's really powerful for personal recovery and planetary recovery. Yes. The question always is, can we reach the social tipping point before we reach the environmental tipping points? Mm. That's always, always a question. But the aim has to be to reach the social tipping point. And to learn, I think, to re-democratise ourselves and learn to be with each other again. Mm. Because whatever happens, we need to know how to look after one another mm -hmm. and to adapt to mm -hmm. the utter craziness that is heading our way. Yeah. And, yeah. and that's kind of paradoxically a place of solace for me. Mm -hmm.